Practically overnight, he became the very symbol, both in China and internationally, of the non-violent struggle for such rights in China. We can say that Liu reminds us of Nelson Mandela. Liu has only exercised his civil rights. He has not done anything wrong. He must be released. Four thousand four hundred twenty-four miles east of the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony, Liu Xiaobo was finishing his first year of an eleven-year prison sentence given to him by the Chinese government for his involvement in drafting Charter Eight, calling for political reform, an independent judiciary, and increased attention to human rights. His actions during the Tiananmen Square crisis of 1989, coupled with Charter Eight, was viewed as a Western ploy to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party and limit its influence in the nation. December twenty eighth, nineteen fifty five, in Changchun, China, Liu Xiaobo is born to a professor of Chinese and a nursery school teacher, both educators at Northeast Normal University. His nation is under the leadership of Mao Zedong, a controversial communist and founder of the People's Republic of China. Just three years later, the campaign known as the Great Leap Forward, aiming to transform China's economy from agrarian to industrial, will sweep the nation, leading to the deadliest famine in history and the deaths of 30 to 55 million. In 1966, when Liu is 11 years old, Zedong initiates the Cultural Revolution, a socio-political movement lasting 10 years and marred by class struggles, in an attempt to counter revolutionaries to the regime. Growing up amidst these tumultuous times, Liu encountered varying viewpoints as his father remained loyal to the Communist Party, while others around him were outspoken against it. As the greatest disparity across China remained the socio-economic divide between the poor rural areas in the middle of the country, contrasted against the wealth of rapidly growing coastal cities, inequalities and problems arose quickly. With the corrupt and negligent government ruled by the Communist Party of China, or the CCP, it became clear that the interests of the people were rarely taken into consideration by the government. Media and freedoms were under constant surveillance and complete control by the state, limiting accountability and muddying transparency of political processes. They have no need to liberalize politics because then what they're afraid of is that there's going to be competition for the party. Party won't stay primary. The country will become unstable, and they can't have either of those things. During his time in college, Liu began to attract attention as he published criticisms of fellow scholars, condemning the deeply rooted beliefs held by the nation's elite. He called for the westernization of China, claiming it would lead to progress, and that clinging to traditional Chinese culture simply precipitated poverty and further setbacks. He became widely known as an activist as he wrote about the drawbacks of socialism and the ways in which it impeded democratization. In 1987, Liu rose to literary fame across the globe with *The Critique of Choice*, a dialogue with Li Zihao. This book of essays critiqued the work of prominent Chinese cultural philosopher Li Zihao, whose post-communist ideologies were shaping the minds of the nation's young intellectuals. Around the time Liu returned home in 1989. Pro-democracy movements took effect and procured momentum. The Tiananmen crisis began with student demonstrations in the spring of 1989, appearing to be about issues such as inflation and corruption, but with the real aim of overthrowing the communist government. By mid-May, there were over one million rallygoers spread out in Tiananmen Square. Deng Xiaoping and other CCP leaders felt threatened by the protests and ultimately ordered a military crackdown on June 4th, imposing martial law with deadly force. Thousands were killed or wounded by soldiers forcing their way into the square. During these turbulent and chaotic months, Liu served as a mentor for students during the protests and joined the week-long hunger strike in May, along with thousands of others. He was known for helping to negotiate a retreat of protesters when the soldiers continued to advance. After Chinese troops forced everyone from the square, he went into hiding and was thus sentenced to 21 months in prison for his participation in the strike. 
The Chinese government worked diligently to censor Liu's publications and ideologies. He was later expelled from Beijing Normal University, and his publications were banned. The media depicted Jiabo as a manipulative militant attempting to overthrow a prospering nation. Many believed Jiabo would seek refuge abroad, but he refused and continued freelance writing after being released from imprisonment. He was jailed several more times from 1995 to 1996, and yet again from 96 to 99 for his involvement in democracy and human rights movements. After his release, Liu continued to write political criticism, but with his growing support, the Chinese government found it harder and harder to control his ideas. It was reported that his house was closely monitored, and his internet and phones were often tapped. While writing a human rights report in 2003, the contents of Jiabo's home were confiscated by the government. The Communist Party of China continued to dismiss Jiabo, censoring his name, observing his actions, and placing him on house arrest for the later parts of his life. On December 29, 2009, Liu was given his final prison sentence of 11 years for the crime of inciting subversion of state power. In 2008, he was a main contributor in the drafting of a manifesto. It was divided into three parts. The first looks back at China's recent history. The second outlines the author's fundamental principles, and the third presents a list of suggested reforms. It damns the last several decades of communist rule and explicitly demands the freedom of expression by declaring, "We should end the practice of viewing words as crimes." His unusually harsh prison sentence highlights the tragedy of an entire nation's unfair judicial system and their desire to repress all inflammatory thought and speech. In October 2010, while Liu was still in prison, the Nobel Committee awarded him the Peace Prize for his nonviolent struggle for the fundamental human rights in China. Jiabo became the first Chinese citizen still residing in China to win this accolade, a triumph for the nation's democratization movement. He believed the award belonged to everyone who signed Charter Eight, but without means for him to accept the award, the Chinese government was easily able to censor the news. Foreign broadcasters, including CNN and BBC, were blocked for the days following, and the Chinese Foreign Ministry denounced the award, proclaiming that Jiabo's name desecrated the award's ideals. Any individual displaying support for Jiabo was either detained or put under surveillance. The Chinese government, attempting to undermine his efforts, was also able to deter many nations from attending the ceremony. Fifteen out of sixty-five countries were absent from the ceremony due to China's heavy lobbying and political ties with these nations. Eight years into his prison sentence, Liu was diagnosed with terminal liver cancer. With the government refusing to let him leave the country, he was granted medical parole to receive treatment in a guarded, inadequate Chinese hospital. Yet they did not even allow him access to this care until it was too late. Two months after this diagnosis, on July 13, 2017, he passed away at 61 years old. The tragedy lies in more than just a nobleman's death, but also at the lack of global outcry against his prison sentence and the ruthless communist regime. Only after prolonged hesitation and deterioration of Jiabo's health did the governments of world leaders such as France, Germany, and the United States call for his release. Yet a general apathy towards political injustice can also be seen within the nation's own borders. As the Chinese economy boomed, citizens acknowledged an implicit social contract in which they turned a blind eye to a lack of political advancement in exchange for enjoying great economic progress. Nevertheless, many more Chinese citizens are carrying out small but significant peaceful acts of protest against human rights abuses today than in 1989 or 2008. When Liu drafted Charter Eight eleven years ago, he collected ten thousand signatures, even though the document only circled the internet for a short amount of time before being removed by Chinese censorship. I believe, as Liu Xiaobo said, we have no enemy, and that's different kind of politics for China. If we don't change the nature of politics, we have no hope. So Liu Xiaobo is more important. I ever. For his long, nonviolent struggle for human rights and political freedom in China, Liu was left a seat at the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. His empty chair and unmistakable absence in the crowd symbolized the tragic response to his triumphant actions. Though his legacy will continue to serve as an inspiration, his chair will remain forever empty.